uh, run that gave me my first big break, break in print, like so many of you. He was the first one to review my act way back when, and to be supportive of all the years. He came and sang in the celebration circle a number of times, speaking of bringing religion or spirituality, spirituality. into a religious setting. And if you'll do the Lord's Prayer for us, please. Together we'll sing, perhaps you know this version. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, I will merchandise ready to go, right? <coughs> How we would have it set up, right? I mean, so, um, and now I'd like to, to bring up his friend Roy, who has a lovely prayer to sing as well, that um, it moved us all at hospice. And at, so in the last couple of days of uh, my uncle, even to the very last minute, he was critiquing people. It was fantastic. <laughs> this song is called Now the day is done. <clears throat> now the day is done and all is still Jim And that picture is forever, and so I'm very grateful to Jerry 
And Jerry and I um, actually met with um, one of Uncle Ronnie's benefits, and I'm very blessed of all the things that he's ever done for Ron, and he can talk a little bit more about him, but he has a wonderful speech that he's prepared to give you enlightenment on exactly who this forever young man, this funny man, this talented man, <laughs> this cantankerous man is. Well, it's, it's great to see this, uh, this room full of friends, old and new, out here. And I, I guess, as, as Ron would say, man, the kind of things a musician has to do to draw a crowd in this town. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is one of those days that are, that's a part of everyone's journey, but certainly one that, with the strength of Ron's spirit and the ferocity of his fight, we assumed was still several years away. Life, it said, can be broken down into three segments, a beginning, a middle, and an ending. The first and last of those are little more than the blink of an eye, but the middle, that's the essence of life. That's where we're given the chance to plant the seeds of discovery, to cultivate those seeds, and wonder in watching them grow and thrive and then nourish our souls and the world around us with the fruits of our living. I'm sure that all of us have known someone along the way who's taken that middle, seg excuse me, that middle segment for granted and reached the ending with too many stones left unturned and having regrets about life left unlived. I think it's clear to everyone here today that Ron's not that person. I first met Ron when I was a freshman in high school in 1980. My love of music had grown beyond simply musical tastes that I developed via family and friends. I was pretty sure there was a whole world of music out there and all I needed to do was connect with it. I hatched this idea of talking my school bus driver into dropping me off after school at a couple of the cool record stores that I had heard people talk about both of which happened to be on the opposite side of town from my home. It was a tough sell, but eventually he agreed with the promise that I knew the city bus routes home <laughs> and, that, and that I wouldn't tell. So keep this a secret. <laughs> One of those stores was Sound Warehouse, whose manager was none other than Ron Young. I can't really recall the specifics of more than a couple of our conversations from then, but I'm sure that there was a lot of me asking, do you know of any records that sound like such and such? And Ron answering back with, there are lots of records that sound like that, but you should listen to this. It doesn't sound like anything else. It was during this period, and in large part due to Ron, that I discovered artists as diverse as the Ramones, Elvis Costello, Bo Diddley, Alice Cooper and Mahogany Rush. This was also where I first discovered It's Only Rock and Roll magazine, the music-only paper that Ron and a ragtag staff of like-minded locals published. What a bonanza. Not only did I have a seemingly endless amusement park filled with records of every size, shape, color, and musical persuasion, and issue after issue, of a free newspaper assembled by and for music geeks, of which I was quickly becoming one myself. But I'd also made contact with a living, breathing, rock and roll reference source and a quality consultant. I had no idea at the time that this was just the beginning of what would become a 37-year friendship. Aside from its only rock and roll, I had begun, begun to frequent grocery stores, uh, magazine racks, picking up on magazines like Circus, Crawdaddy, Who Put the Bomb, and others, and decided that my calling in life would be to write about music and hang out with the musicians that I was listening to at the time. Granted, that was a rather lofty ambition, but hey, I knew the San Antonio guy who, in my own mind, had done exactly that. So I called Ron Young for advice on breaking into the magical world of rock stars and parties. <laughs> <laughs> His advice was not exactly what I was expecting to hear, but it turned out to be sage and sensible. He told me, always write whatever you really feel about the music. 
be prepared to sneak your camera into shows that you want to photograph. And even if the first 20 artists that you ask for an interview with turn you down, and they probably will, don't give up because someone will eventually say yes. I ended up writing for a few local music papers and slowly got the hang of it. But even when my pieces were clunky and amateurish, Ron would offer merciful criticism and encouragement. I'm guessing that he caught a familiar gleam in me that may have reminded him of his own musical, his own journalistic beginnings. By the time it's only rock and roll was shelved, the two daily papers had become had, had begun to see the value of having dedicated music writers on staff. This changed the traje trajectory of the San Antonio music scene by giving the public in mass a pair of brand new outlets for music news, reviews, and information. Further evidence of the magazine's role in this evolution was that Jim Beal signed on with the Express News and Ron Young became the music editor for the San Antonio Light. My family had always subscribed to the Express News and I, I hounded my grandparents to save me the light every day when they finished it. So I managed to keep up with both former It's Only Rock and Rollers. In late 1986, I gained more confidence in my writing abilities and coupled with the fact that Ron and Jim Beal had graduated from this little magazine that I loved to daily newspapers, I decided to approach the light in the Express about freelancing. The lights editor told me that they didn't use freelancers, so I talked with the arts editor at the Express who asked to see an example of my work, after which I was in. Over the next year, I actually did interview and write advances on some of my favorite big time musicians and rock stars. This was the life for me. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the San Antonio Light was bought out and the new owners ceased publication. I felt terrible for Ron, as I knew how much he loved this job and how great he was at it. But then I stopped by the Express one day to pick up a check for one of my pieces, and I was told that they were no longer going to be able to use freelancers. Oh because several former light staffers were coming on board. Oh. <laughs> One of which was my old pal, Ron Young. And honestly, as dejected as I was about being downsized, it was some consolation knowing that it was to Ron's benefit in a roundabout way. Ron was so great at what he did, and he, he deserved to have the opportunity to, to continue to do it. By the mid-90s, I was brought on to book the live music at Billy Blue's Barbecue, where they already had a popular weekly songwriter night in place. And who was one of the hosts? I'm, I'm sure you can guess, it was Ron Young. <laughs> um, he'd recently jumped head first into writing original songs and creating his own music. And by gosh, he was really good at that too. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the paths of the guru and the musically adventurous kid who had met all those years ago seemed to be inextricably, inextricably intertwined. It would happen again and again. I took a trip out to Nashville in 1997 and headed to the mecca of southern retail music stores, the original Ernest Tubb record store on Broadway. And there at the helm was Ron Young. <laughs> This was a side job for him, though. Uh, at the time, he was contracted to write songs for a local music publishing house. Then, during the final days of Civil Oak Creek Country Club's historic 10-year run, there he is again, freshly home from his Nashville stint. Wherever there was a musical happening, there was a chance he'd run into Ron Young. He did, he'd been involved in every South Texas entertainment publication, live music venue, and retail music outlet to come and go over the years, and had an endless supply of stories about his travels, adventures, and experiences. Even Bruce Springsteen dedicated a song to him from the stage of the Municipal Auditorium. How, how's that for being a real deal? Yeah. <laughs> When Ron received the ominous news that he had cancer, it was the beginning of an entirely 
different sort of voyage that he that, than he had ever experienced before. One that forced all of life's typical concerns and daily duties into the background and replaced them with uncertainty, trepidation, and the need to reprioritize his approach to everything, but without any real prior knowledge about what it is exactly that he would be fighting against. I remember him telling me that he had started contacting anyone and everyone he could find who either had first-hand experience or a friend or family member who was battling cancer. He did everything he could to absorb information about this horrible disease and said that education was going to be his most powerful tool in the fight. Equally formidable were his friend Tana Thomason and his niece Nikki Young, his caretakers who would be by his side throughout. Over the last five years, as he received both good news and sometimes not so good, Ron remained strong-willed, determined, confident, and confident that he was going to beat cancer and move on to his next musical chapter. It was clear, too, that the overwhelming love and support that he received from family and friends was a large part of what fueled his strength and focus. In addition to conventional treatments, he explored dietary changes and homeopathic remedies, and he delved further into spirituality as he regularly prayed with friends and concentrated on understanding and defining the roots of his own personal beliefs. As his condition deteriorated, I believe that knowing he fought with all he had and that he kept his mind and his heart open throughout it all likely gave him a great deal of solace as his time drew to a close. Ron's final days and hours were filled with love, family, friends, and the music, which had been part of his life's, which, which had, excuse me, which had been his life's guiding light for nearly seven decades. He was being kept com comfortable and free of pain with medication, but there were some beautiful moments of lucidity in our friend's final hours. <laughs> Nikki arrived at the hospice after spending a full day of work and the previous days and nights there with Ron and standing at the end of his bed, she says, I haven't showered in days. I feel so tired and dirty. But Uncle Ronnie would still be the one to tell me that I'm beautiful. Wouldn't you, Uncle Ronnie? With a twinkle in his eye, Ron smiled and shook his head yes and then whispered, I love you, to his niece. This is a man who was a journalist, an adventurer, a devotee, an advocate and a champion, a historian, a songwriter, and a musician. He's a son, an uncle, a brother, a friend, and a sounding board to so many. In other words, Ron is the man who did one heck of a job on the middle. <laughs> and you know what, if, if we can, let's give what Ron loved so much, he loved the approval and every musician who works hard loves it and deserves it. Let's give Ron a, a big rousing round of applause here. songwriters jam or any sort of thing, right? Okay. Yep. So he kind of did this and Butch Morgan really wanted to be here and uh, he is actually, there's a lot going on, right? First of all, uh, we have a lot of musicians that we unfortunately lost this last week. 
uh, two Jimmys, uh, Iran, and uh, but there's also several music festivals happening, which Ron would say the show must go on. So I was talking to Butch this morning. He was very devastated that his replacement didn't show up, and uh, he actually was going to send something. But um, so I said. Which I don't know if I can do it the way you do, but uh, he gave me some pointers, so I hope I'm doing okay. So without further ado, here's Rick. Good afternoon. I'm going to do a song Ron wrote. Uh, it was always a personal song to him. Never, never heard anybody else sing it. Sears and Monkey War, washing machines and TV sets, refrigerator park. When he hit that double nickel boy, he retired, tired, not a care, sorry. Fat of the land and a good life, back is like the arms of an easy chair. Never went to church on Sunday, never watched the football game. He go down to the fishing hole, sunshine or in rain. All he ever wanted was a lake so smooth and clear. Full of beer Going fishing Gonna catch old Joe When's he coming back Just don't know Can't take it with you When it's time to go Going fishing Gonna take it slow A secret kind of wish You may never catch the big one, son It always slips away But half the fun of fishing Is there's always another day He was born in the Great Depression 1929 62 years later He just ran out of line Now he's up in heaven off all his sins. You can bet that he's sitting in the bass boat with a fisher of men. Going fishing, gonna catch old Joe. When's he coming back? But we just don't know. Can't take it with you. about five years ago or so, six years ago. Betty told me about this friend of hers from high school that sang uh, with Scott Gale and she dragged me over. They didn't have to drag me very hard because I love music. Anyway, we went and saw him at Augie's Barbecue. Yeah. And uh, that was it. I, I became a groupie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just followed him ever since. And so that song, Go and Fishing, is about my grandfather, and he sang that. And so I think it's appropriate that I bring my father up. And he had a fun couple things to say. So this is David Young. Daddy. Daddy. Showtime. Daddy. Daddy. That sounds so old. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, hope y'all were taking notes earlier when Jerry was up here. This is going to be a test. <laughs> Those who pass don't have to put a tip in the tip jar. Oh! All right, musicians. Isn't there supposed to be a tip jar up here? <laughs> okay, all right, we'll find you. can buy a CD on your way out. <laughs> Seriously, thank you all for being part of his life. how he played with uh, Scott, and here is Scott Gale. So 
Uncle Ronnie introduced me to Scott Gale. I actually begged him to introduce me to Scott Gale. So well, for, you're sorry about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I begged. <laughs> I begged. Mistakes, huh? I begged and begged and begged and begged. I was like, um, so I heard you have a friend that like wrote the theme song to Stay by the Bell. Is that true? I said, because I'm like, grew up in that, and that's like the coolest thing ever. And he's like, I thought I was the coolest thing ever. So, oh, you're cool too. But can I meet Scott Gale? It's even cooler that you know him. So, um, this is Scott, and Scott's going to say a little fun things. But it got to the point where my Uncle Ronnie only liked me to talk about Say by the Bell. He, he only appreciated that I liked it. I know that he probably drove you nuts, right? Never. No, that's right. I thought he was like, we're not singing that song again. And then I'd be there and he's like, all right, for Nikki, we'll sing it. I never get tired of it. I know, you don't, but he did. So Scott, tell everybody how you know uh, Ron and then we'll let you go from there. Thank you, Nikki. Well, first of all, my deepest condolences to Bobby and to David and to Nikki and to Tanya and every, all his family. And Ron was funny. He was really, really funny. And I mean, just not telling jokes funny, but he was so quick it, with, I mean, one day we were rehearsing and we walked out of rehearsal and in a building across the street, two huge turkey buzzards landed right on the top of the building. And he turned to me and goes, oh, they seen your act. <laughs> <laughs> quick like that. But I've, um, I've known Ron, uh, we, were, we were partners for a couple of years. We were music partners. You have to qualify that now. But, but, but uh, we we went to we went to Robert E. Lee together, and, um, uh, and so we knew each other there. And then about a year or two out of high school, we formed this band with David and Ken. He's somewhere there. He is right there. And the best thing about this band is that we rehearsed behind the Show Palace Lounge <laughs> on Hildebrand and where the railroad tracks go by. And we were too young to go in the place, but the dancers came out and listened to us play. And that was the greatest thing, and we always looked forward to rehearsals. Because the band was truly horrible. Wait, wait, the um, name. Guess the name. The Creation. Right. And, and uh, that's right, the name was The Creation. And it was, we created something, but let me tell you how this band was. We did a battle of the bands once, and we came in third place, which was kind of hard to do because there was only two bands. <laughs> And so, uh, so we fast, fast forward uh, 20, 30, 40 years later, and um, I saw Ron play. Um, it might have been Kaz Beers or it was someplace or something. And I said, wow, that looks like fun. And Ron at the time was looking for someone to play his music. And if you know Ron, it was all about playing his music yeah. all the time. And I said, well, Ron, I really like your music, so let's do this. So we rehearsed and rehearsed, and, and Ron had a great work ethic. Uh, if we had to do one line 50 times to get it right, we'd do it 55 times. And we always enjoyed it. And we played our first gig, and it might have, I'm not sure if it was almost a cafe or, or, the, or Kaz Beers or wherever it was, and we did our first set, and miraculously, People just loved it. I mean, it was just like we were looking at each other, going, "What?" Well, well, actually, after the first set, we, we as soon as we got through playing, we started screaming at each other. I mean, they're kind of in a stage whisper. You, blah, 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 blah. I mean, for like 15, 20 seconds, people were just like, just, just uh, fumes were coming out of our heads. And then we looked at each other and go, "Hey, I think we got something going here." <laughs> and um, and the buzzards left. And the buzzards, right? Yes. And. Uh, Ron sang the first 14 songs, <laughs> they were, and, uh, and I got one song, and Jim got no songs, and, and we, we were laughing, he said, what is this? And Ron goes, well, I thought we'd do our best material. material. <laughs> and um, I see Sam's here, Sam Henry's here, and um, we were playing, I think, at the Hanging Tree one day, and, um, and to tell you the truth, Uh, Ron, he made me a, he made me a, a much better musician than, than I ever was before. And Ron sometimes was a little self-conscious about his playing. Well, let me tell you, Ron played without a thumb. And if all you out there who ever tried to play guitar without a thumb, whether you're in the classical arts or playing the rock and roll way, uh, try, you know, the, he was able to play without a thumb. And I mean, that was most of the sum, and that was beyond me. And um, 
but he he did make me a, a a better musician. In fact, Sam, after we did our set, Sam came up to us and said, and he, he said, Scott, have you always played like that? Oh yeah. So uh, I won't do it as well as Ron did, but I'll give it a shot. Well, we gotta sing along, right? Of course you. Yeah. Well, I got a little song that needs a little help. Cause you know I can't sing it all by myself That's why I called up a friend of a friend of mine He said he could be Willie on the line He's played with everybody from Julio to Wayland And if you get him on your CD it'll be smooth sailing So I'm waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie. I'm waiting on Willie to help me sing the song. Well, I'm waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie, waiting on Willie. I'm waiting on Willie, Willie. Don't you take too long. Well, you can bring a long trigger and make your out. Hey, you think you help my CD sell? Well, the red-headed stranger is getting kind of gray. And he's even bigger than old George Strait. <laughs> and Taylor Swift and Kanye. <laughs> well, just like Frank and Madonna, he's number one. And if you don't say Willie, you know which one. Cause I'm waiting on Willie. 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 Waiting on Willie, 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 waiting on
I think all of you can relate to this. When you helped Ron in any way, you gave him a book, shared a meal, told him you liked one of his songs. He would say thank you, and not out of any kind of sense of obligation or a yes sir, no ma'am thing that you may have learned in, in, in Sunday school, but because he was really grateful and appreciated your kindness. And on the flip side of that, you know, Ron had some reasons to be angry. Life threw him several curved balls, a couple spinners too. And sometimes he got mad at this or that, or even at one of us. But he didn't hold a grudge, unless somebody really deserved it, like NBA referees. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or the fools who never uh, elected Doug Stiles to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But other than that, you know, it, it's a big world out there with, with a lot of people. And there's always going to be conflicts and disagreements, but life is a lot better when we try to understand each other's point of view and to be as forgiving toward each other as we possibly can. We don't always remember that. I don't always remember that. But Ron did. Thank you, my friend. We shared a lot of time together and as Scott said, and I can say that I think a lot of you can as well. Ron, I'm a better person for having known you. Thanks, Thank you, David. Impacted, imparted, and instilled in me to be a part of the music scene. Um, I hope I can continue on. And um, I wanted to. Uh, just say that I'm, I'm honored to know you now, David, so thank you for sharing your message of music and knowledge of music, so I hope I will make him proud. And thank you. here's another friend, um, Pat. Pat, yes. Pat Jackson, come on up. Hello. You've been with me from day one in all this. I appreciate it. boarding house he lived in a boarding house <laughs> and he wrote a song miss loretta which is about our landlady and um after that when he moved to san antonio you know i don't have any musical talent whatsoever and he would play nursing homes and he invited me to come along and i put on a cowboy hat a wig and cowboy Boots and I have absolutely, I learned from Ronnie, I had absolutely no beat whatsoever. Because <laughs> I had one of those things you go like, I didn't even know what you call it, tambourine. tambourine. Yeah. And I would work the nursing home crowd and he, he paid me with a Diet Coke. But anyway, you need to get the sugar part. Yeah, you know, well, you know, and, and Ronnie, I have, I was born with a biological brother. And I have two uh, brothers, one sitting right back there, Andy, and my other one is Ronnie. And um, I couldn't really share the musical stuff with him because I am not that way, but we sure did share movies. And we were he was the biggest movie buff and so was I. And he would come over to my house and I'd make dinner. I did that for four years with him with M Boardwalk Empire. I fed him <laughs> countless meals, and being Ronnie, he would email me, you know, if you would just do this with the beans. <laughs> and I went, and Tana knows, and I went, you know, Ronnie, why don't you eat before you get here? <laughs> but, you know. but I loved him so much, and we even hitchhiked together in Austin, and, you know, he's a big part of my life. And when I see these handsome, handsome pictures of him like that, that's how I remember Ronnie. I remember him like that. I will always call him Ronnie. He's never been Ronned. He's never been Ronnie. A Ron, I can't. Anyway, I'll never, it's so huge to me. I, I can't believe he's gone. 
The bijou will never be the same to me. The bijou will never be the same. And um, he's just my brother, Bobby. I want to thank you for this great, wonderful treasure that you have given the world and me. It's so meaningful to me. <laughs> thank you very much. I'd never heard of, and he told me why I had to listen to them, which I'm sure some of you experienced. And he also got why I liked some of the people no one had ever heard of, being from the East Coast. 
We could talk for hours, and I always admired how he had the same passion and enthusiasm when he spoke with the customers that he had when he spoke with all of us. I was his cancer support buddy, and as we've been going to his medical appointments for the last five or six years, we've spent countless hours in waiting rooms talking about everything. I'm sure all of you who don't know me, I know about you because he talked about you. <laughs> that you probably didn't want told. But um, he also talked a lot in recent times about how he was worried about, you know, he felt he had not carved out any kind of legacy, lasting effect with his music. And I told him many times how his music would live on, as well as his writings, he didn't buy it. I feel so lucky to have witnessed an amazing thing in Ron's final days. During the last four days of his life, once we knew we were approaching the end of his journey, I received so many calls from people all around the country who had worked with him 30 years ago and more to tell me, beg me to please tell him how much he meant in their lives, how he changed their lives, and I passed that along to him. Then I witnessed so many more people um, come to pour through the door of his hospital room to say their goodbyes, and many of you were here today, and many people came to pray with him, to sing with him. They did, this kept coming. Many of you came multiple times. And he got to hear how much he meant to everyone and how instrumental he was in their lives. And or he, had, he had started their careers or in their love or understanding of music. And I believe he finally did understand what a great legacy he was leaving. And he knew for a fact that he was truly loved. So I want to thank all of you who gave him that gift and that peace of mind. has a story and a possible song. This is Dave Muska. Dave, I gotta know all about you. Dave, come on up. I think you gotta do some snaps. You do that for the open mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. This is my first open mic funeral service. <laughs> I uh, I first met Ron about five years ago when I was talking to do it an open mic at a spec store with Tom Moss. It's the first time I'd ever been up on a stage. This is the story I'm telling. I just want to tell it. go back to that. And Ron would show up now and then, and it was always such a pleasure. Uh, Hank Harrison was the host there, and he encouraged me as did Ron. And uh, Hank always put out a newsletter of who played with your pictures and everything. And it was just such an honor to have my name in the same paragraph as Ron. And uh, it got to where he'd show up at some of them there, and then we moved to a homeless pharmacy and then the pig pen. And when I would walk in the room, and he knew me by name, I was so, so proud. Uh, but anyway, I had uh, heard a song on the radio a few months ago that I hadn't heard in about 10 years. And the song is not really the important part of the story. That's why I'm not going to play it. I'll just tell the story of the, of the song. I heard it on the radio, so I looked up on, on the line, and it was a song by Emily Herring. Oh, I'm not Emily, I'm sorry, Caroline Eric, called Mortified. It's just a beautiful song, and I hadn't heard it in so long, so I wanted to learn it, and uh, I practiced it about 200 times, and finally played it for the, the open mic at, uh, at the pig pen. I think you might have been there that night. And uh, I got up and I played, and, and there's a line in the song, that's a, it's a kind of the important part of the song, where it says, uh, I should have been ashamed, I should have been mortified, I should have hung my head, dug me a hold, and climbed inside. And when I got through with the song, I sat down at the table. Tom was sitting on my left side, and Ron was on my right side. And Tom said, you really need to emphasize that line, because that's the most important part of the song, and you're not emphasizing it. And I just kind of nodded and smiled and rolled my eyes, and I, I thought I did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron says, no, you need to punch that line up. <laughs> I said, you know, that's something I better take seriously. <laughs> but we're all kind of missing it. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. In 1990, when uh, my wife convinced me I needed to start playing music in front of people again, and I went to, uh, on my birthday, went to an open mic they were doing at the Boardwalk Bistro. And uh, I met Ron there. Uh, two, two things that I always remember about Ron, anytime I talk to him, uh, well, one was I, I like to think I know a lot of stuff. And 
And so I'd always like say, oh, did you know that when Bruce Springsteen, whatever, you know, and I wouldn't even get done with what I was going to say. And Ron would say, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And he always <laughs> knew ahead of time, you know, what I, whatever I was going to surprise him with, he always knew. So supportive of me and my music and my attempted musical career, more, much more so than I have ever been. And so, uh, thinking of that, I am. I wasn't going to tell you that I wrote this song, but I can just hear Ron saying, "You knucklehead, tell him you wrote this." Song. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is for Ron, and it's really for Nikki and um, David and the rest of the family. So. This is called "Come the Dawn." When the world has fallen on my shoulders And my mind has never known such pain And I am lost, not knowing where to turn You will light my way with understanding To your care I once more shall return Come the dawn when I need you Giving strength Help me carry on With your blood You will wash away my heartaches Come the dawn All my troubles will be gone If my heart is heavy with the future And my dreams are haunted by the past I can rest my head upon your shoulder And loving peace at last Come the dawn You will be there when I need you Giving strength To help me carry on With your blood You will walk my heart aches. Come the dawn, all my troubles will be gone. Come the dawn, all my troubles will be gone. children and the reason why I'm doing this is because I want people to know a little bit about him when he's young it's always young forever young yeah forever young um, there were seven grandchildren initially and then Brock came along later and so uh, there was Ronnie and then there was me and then there was Clay 
and then the rest of them really didn't matter because we <laughs> we gave we gave oh, up. She's crazy. <laughs> we ganged up on them all the time, That's and nice. and there were four of them, uh, and three of us, but we were cool, <laughs> you know. Uh, what I want to say about Ronnie is that we came from a musical family. My grandfather, Ron's grandfather, yep, yeah, uh, they had one of those, let's get together every Sunday and everybody bring something to play and we'll do it. We had a lot of reunions and we had a lot of time with our cousins. I know we were mean to you, and I'm sorry, but... <laughs> oh, sure, now? Sure. <laughs> now? Yeah, well, confession time. All right. I have one son, and his sure. name is Clay, and that is after my cousin Clay. But it was always kind of Clay and me and Ryan. We were always off doing something, and, and you know, we, we were adventurous. But Ron was was, from the very beginning, he, he, was, he was out here, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, he uh, was outside the box. For a brief moment, I sang in the band with Ronnie, but it was rock and roll. I had my own band, which was an all-girl rock and roll band. Thought we were cool, you know. Anyway, to make a, I'm trying to make this short, but you know, you start remembering things, and we were the three musketeers. We really were. I mean, it, there was a, there was like a two and a half to three year difference between the first three and the next four. So every time after we would text, and he'd ask me how I was doing, I'd ask, you know, well, how's it going, you know, and everything. It always ended with, I love you, cuz. And we would both, and of course the other one would say it back. It just depended on who said it first. David knows the one regret I have. Being in the parking lot to go see him when, when you text me that it died the night, the middle of the night. And, but I remember, I can remember way back. And yeah, he was skinny and he was lanky and everything else. But the one thing I want to say, I love you cuz. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say something to the family first. Uh, I go to way too many funerals, and I'm sure it has something to do with my age now that I'm in my late 30s. <laughs> I have never seen as many people get up and speak for anyone as we have here today. So how about everyone give yourself a round of applause. I feel so lucky to be here. I met Ron in the middle 80s, early to middle 80s. I was working at the San Antonio Light, and Ron was a music uh, writer and editor then. And I went to work there uh, for the paper, and Ron uh, was lucky enough to be on contract or freelancing or something. But I can remember all I wanted to do was review films, but I also had to edit and do office work and things like that. But Ron would come in and he would say, here's my column. And I'd say, thank you, Ron. And he would leave. And I would ask to stay here and edit things all day long. And, and they told me, Ron is a writer. He covers music for us. We don't need him to edit and he knows what he's talking about, so he writes his material, brings it in, and gives it to us. And I thought, you can do that? <laughs> so that's a goal that I sort of set for myself. And I love words. 
And I, uh, all of you songwriters, I can't believe how talented you are because when I do a movie review, generally they're 500 words. And I can remember I used to also have to write the mini review. And the mini review would be 30 words. And I would say, how can you criticize a movie in 30 words? <laughs> well, you songwriters, you say what you have to say in less than that. What, a, what an amazing gift. And Ron had the benefit and the gift to do both. Ron was a writer of words and a writer of songs. And when he wrote his music column for the San Antonio Light, he didn't mention Ron Young. He mentioned other great talent. And he promoted others trying to be what he also wanted to be but this was their time in his column. I'll give you an example. When I was at the San Antonio Light, one of the anchors on TV, a news guy, got fired. They just fired him one day. And the San Antonio Light didn't have a TV critic at the time. So some genius thought it'd be a great idea to hire this TV anchor man to be our TV writer for the newspaper. So he came in and he worked, I remember I was seeing him across the newsroom working feverishly on his first column, and he must have spent hours and hours and hours. And finally, right at deadline, this guy handed in his column, and what it was, he had interviewed himself <laughs> <laughs> about what it was like to transition from being on TV to writing for a newspaper. It went something like, so, Jim, <laughs> what was it like? Well, Jim, uh, here's, here's what it was like. I used to work over there, and now I work over here. That was not Ron Young. And I always admired Ron for doing some things that I never did. For instance, uh, I love comedy. And there was a time in my life where I should have gone to New York or L.A. where the comedy clubs were, but I didn't have the guts at the time, or I was too dumb, basically. Ron Young wanted to be a songwriter. He wanted to sell his songs. He wanted to write it and, and sing his songs. He went to Nashville. And that's not easy to do, so I'll admire that. Uh, say how much I admire that in Ron. I'm gonna wrap up with one little quick story. I know Ron Young had many, many, many great performances and concerts but I saw him about a year and a half ago, I think it was, and it was at an assisted living retirement home on 3009 out here. There were about, I don't know, 30 people in the audience, and Ron had gone there regularly, and they loved when Ron Young came. And we were gonna have lunch, and after his performance, and so Ron sang, and uh, he had another gentleman with him, is anyone here that was there that day? Patrick. Patrick yes. yes, oh yes, hi. And I remember that day so, so well because uh, after the performance, before he put all of this stuff away, he went around and shook every hand of everyone in that retirement facility. And I could just see the look on the people's faces uh, at what he brought into their life. And I know he wasn't feeling well, and he was singing some songs that they wanted to hear, and it was just a magic moment. I'm thinking that was one of the best Ron Young concerts right there. So I will never forget Ron Young. He's with me every day, and I would just like to say to the family that what an honor it is to be here today and an honor to share a little bit of his life. Thank you so much. says in all things give thanks and there's two things to give thanks for here today 
First off, we all have the privilege of knowing Ron in one way, shape, or another. And the second one is I'm not going to sing for you today. <laughs> so be glad. Um, I first met Ron in late 77, 1978, uh, at the illustrious original location of Apple Records. I'm going to college, second year of college. I'm on my own. I spent more time at Apple Records than I did in school. I think I skipped more <laughs> classes to hang out at Apple. And part of the reason I hung out at Apple, um, first off, Monty was a know-it-all in music, and there were other people who hung out there as well, like, gee, Ron. <laughs> and uh, between us all, we loved music. That was the, the core. Um, everybody had their own little things of music that they liked and shared with each other, and it was just this wonderful, um, time of discovery. You talked about the seeds of discovery. Boy, oh boy, let me tell you, there were a lot of seeds and there was a whole bunch of fertilizer. <laughs> and so, towards the, the very, very beginning of 78, um, hanging out with Ron and, and Frank Rodarte, I remember, was there, the jalapeno. Wow, you got a nickname, the jalapeno. That's, that's cool. I didn't know who any of these people were. Um, and so anyway, Ron has this notion that he's going to have a newspaper, and it's a free newspaper, and it's going to be a music newspaper. It's like, dude, you're nuts, really? And so to be there when the ideas are generating and churning and all was just amazing for my young mind at that point in time. Well, as it progressed, well, we need to get some stories for the newspaper. And so I remember the first thing that we did um, or that I was kind of a part of was uh, the Ramones, Ramones played at Randy's Rodeo, but the Runaways opened up. Hey, I'm just fresh 17 and it's the <laughs> Runaways, oh boy. Long story short, we got to sort of talk to Sandy West, which was just over the top for my poor adolescent mind. Got the snub from Joan Jett, and so that was all cool. Second big adventure with Ron, was to New Braunfels, and there was a group called the Violators that were per, uh, performing. They were opening up for a group, or they were opening up for John Nitzinger. Okay, if anybody remembers Nitzinger. So anyway, we're there for the Violators. We're talking to them. They're great. Well, their one guitar player, Kathy, went on to uh, play, I think, bass for the Go-Go's. Jesse Sublet, the bass player, um, wrote rock and roll criminal novels, um, which were kind of cool. Um, so all this, you know, is kind of the core of it. Um, we got to hang out with John Nitzinger and drink beer. I'm not even legal age, right? <laughs> drinking beer with John Nitzinger in New Braunfels. This is cool. Now, all these journeys were made in a little car that I had. The very first car I ever owned was a Honda Civic. And back in those days, all our cars, amongst all our friends, had names. And we always referred to them in the first person. Well, my car uh, was uh, named Hairlip. It was a Honda Civic, so we'd hunk the horn and we'd go, neep, neep, neep. And so Hairlip was always referred to in the first person. Well, the next big adventure was going to be to Austin. Lou Reed was playing. Oh my gosh, Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, you know, huge, huge name. We're going to go see Lou Reed. So, you know, how are we going to get to Austin? We'll take Hairlip. So we all piled into Hairlip. There was Ron, I think Robin Cresswell went, uh, another photographer and a friend of mine, Pat. And so we're all crammed in this tiny little car and it's pouring down rain. Uh, monsoon season hit, we're talking before they had little gates at the low water crossings. If you were stupid enough to go across it, see you, bye-bye. So we're driving to Austin. Visibility is maybe 10 feet in front of the car. The windows are fogged up. We've got four people crammed into this little car. And so we hit Austin, we get to the concert. And one of the coolest moments was when I told the security guy up in the front that I was with, it's only rock and roll, I've got a camera, I'm here to take pictures. Oh, sure, and he cleared out the orchestra pit for me in front of the stage. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And so I'm here and I'm taking pictures and just the, the coolest thing in the world, I lost most of the hearing in this ear standing close to the, the speakers, but still, it's Lou freaking Reed right here, right? And band members are pointing and posing for the camera, and Lou's just totally ignoring me, which is Lou. And so anyway, the show is over, and we're heading to the car, and Ron goes, Lou is staying at whatever hotel it was. We're going to go see if we can get an interview. Lou doesn't talk to anybody, okay? Ron, how did you find out where he is 
to stay. Well, you know, it just did runs kind of run about way. So we pile into Harrowlift and we're heading to the hotel. And it's pouring down rain and we're sitting in this little car and the windows are totally steamed up. And, you know, it's like, oh, it's headlights, taillights, could be, no, no. Finally, a van pulls up. Okay, it's not a limo, it's not a big car. And out comes Lou, his true manager, the lead guitar player, and a backup singer. And we pounce out of the car, and we scared the crap out of these people. <laughs> you know? And, and this was before things got weird and people carried guns and wanted to off rock stars. But anyway, we jump out of the car. The rain stopped miraculously just in time. And there is when we bounce out, Lou! And the look on his face was just like, uh, and the tour manager stops. Uh, stands between us and, you know, Lou doesn't want to talk to anybody, da da da, gave us a run around, talked to the guitar player and the backup singer, told him how much we enjoyed the show. It was great, thank you very much. Oh, you know, oh, you were taking the pictures. Yeah, 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 you remembered, cool. So anyway, we got, we got no interview with Lou. And Ron is devastated. It's like, you know, crap, we didn't expect it, but still there's that little ray of hope that we're going to get to talk to the guy. Well, hop back into the car, and it commences raining again. It's pouring down twice as hard as it was, and we're wiping the windows, and we're heading back to San Antonio. It's like, you know what, there's Denny's. Let's get something to eat. Okay, so we pull into Denny's. We're distraught, we're dismayed, we're devastated, we're just, you know, crap. Lou didn't want to talk to us. Why didn't Lou want to talk to us? So we walk into Denny's, and there in the corner are the Blockheads. It was the opening band for Lou Reed, and it's the Blackheads minus Ian Dury. And they had a limo. It was an old Cadillac limo in the parking lot, we saw it, and didn't put two and two together. It's like, right, it's the Blackheads. Oh, so we were a little more cautious in our approach to the Blackheads. They were eating, you know, sharp utensils. We don't want to get that look, and somebody gets stabbed in the eye with a fork or something. And so we approached him and, and basically got kind of an interview. Um, with them, and that was just the coolest thing in the world. So that what turned out to be not the thing that we were expecting, we were thankful of the fact that we did get to talk to somebody. So we're on the drive back from, from Austin, and it's pouring down rain, and I think the only reason we didn't get washed out in a couple of low water spots was because there were four people in this car, and we had to wait. And uh, so shortly after that, I left the country, I moved to, moved to Australia, and was there, and kind of lost contact with Ron, until I came back, and here it's only rock and roll. It's this really cool magazine with covers that are collectible. And it's like, wow, this has really evolved into something spectacular. And I didn't have a whole lot to do with it after that. I uh, got wrapped up in band stuff. Uh, joined my first band in Australia. And so my perspective changed a little bit. Well, lost contact with Ron after uh, uh, Sound Warehouse and all. You know, ran into him on occasion and stuff. And then, you know, where'd Ron go? He disappeared. Oh, he went to Nashville. What the heck's he doing in Nashville? He's a singer-songwriter. He's writing songs. Like, what? He writes columns. He does, he does you know, critiques and, and pokes fun at other people for doing that. And now he's going to be the subject of the same kind of poking and prodding. How cool. Well, fast forward to not too long ago. I had the privilege to have... Uh, the opportunity to play with Ron on a couple of occasions and uh, a couple of projects didn't quite take off like we had hoped but still uh, as musicians we we made it together and so where we met under one circumstance and ended in a completely different circumstance but was even more directly and all directly related to the love of music uh, is something I'll always remember from Ron and his tenacity to go ahead and and take that step and approach and um, you know you can do that you know you never know unless you step out on that ledge and say excuse me can you answer a question the last text I got from Ron um, was shortly before he passed and it was just a simple text go Spurs go <laughs> to which I replied amen <laughs> and uh, that was my last contact with Ron and with that with the year that Manu Ginobili had this year, and he may or may not play again, but this is my philosophy, because about 14 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I was very, very fortunate to have it discovered early enough to where I did not have to go through the chemo or all, the or all of the ordeals that Ron did for all these five years plus. 
And so I am very blessed and very fortunate. But when you are presented with that opportunity, if you will, it changes your perspective on life. Every moment matters. Every, every opportunity you must seize. And so my philosophy is this. We need to live life like Manu Ginobili plays basketball. <laughs> Not with reckless abandon, but total abandon. God bless Ron. Thanks. Thanks, brother. Times at hand, there's a stir across the land. So begin another day, life's highway. Down city street, down the country road, right the street, the people flow. Let's spread the way. And toes of There is hope with the return. Rips the bill, a prince to burn. It's holding you, never more stray. Five side way. have to do with music. Well, because you're di different. Like, what does that mean? You're Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, we just became friends. And I, rem I remember that because uh, 
a few weeks later, I, got, I asked to transfer to the one in Everest because Bill was there and, and Ron was there. We became this trio of just misfits. <laughs> um, I was the rock and roll guy, Billy was the Elvis guy, and, and Ron was everything else. <laughs> But I used to, we used to dog each other and make fun of each other every chance we got. I mean, that's just what we did. We went to a hundred of concerts together and lunch, and I used to make fun of them. I said, first of all, you're not a rock and roll guy. You're wearing Sperry's. You can't wear Sperry's if you're a rock and roll guy. You wear Sperry's. It's stupid boat shoes you wear all the time. <laughs> I said, and first of all, you walk on your, I've never met anybody walk on their toes. I said, how do you, you walk on your toes? I said, what do you mean? You would do that, you know. <laughs> and this is what we did to each other. We just messed and he was like, I don't walk on my toes. I said, yes, you do. Like you're a ballerina or something. And we just, that's what we did. We just became inseparable three guys. And every time a concert would come, we'd get to meet him. And I remember eating McDonald's with me, Ron, and Garth Brooks. And like four people showed up to meet Garth Brooks that day. There was nobody. And Ron was like, he's pretty good. <laughs> Only became Garth Brooks, but you know. We had, I see the picture with Clint Black. I think there was 22 people. We got brought into the big barbecue with Clint Black and 22 people. We were like, <laughs> so it's great. Uh, there's just so many stories. I, I mean, I didn't even know he played music for the longest time. I had no clue. We hung out, and I remember he was, he was going to do a, a songwriter thing with uh, him and DJ Stone. And I was like, so, <coughs> you, you play? Well, yeah. I said, I've known you 12 years. You couldn't tell me you played? Why would I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I started hanging around. I was like, hey, man, come and hang out with us. You know, bring some people and we can all jam together. So DJ and Ron and, and I we got to do some shows. But I didn't know he played. I had no clue. He always was the interview guy. And he was just always, you know, full of, of hope and making me feel like, you, you can do this, you can do this. So I didn't know he played, and then he went off to Nashville and stuff, and then uh, he just, we saw him, my wife and I saw him for lunch one day when we found out he had cancer and everything. And he was just, oh, well, he was drinking some, what was that juice? The guanabana. Oh my, guanabana. I can't even say the name, I said, I'm Hispanic, I can't say that. <laughs> He was so gone home and stuff. He's like, I tell you, you know, I'll be fine. But you know, I, don't, I don't know what to say other than uh, he's going to be missed. I tell you, I've taken the Spurs game as much as I could. I call my guy, Andrew Tiki, let's go to the game. We go to the game. And, and, and like everybody else, you've got the go Spurs, go Tech. So yeah. 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 I got him every game. And the last one I got had the big F word in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got that one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's in, uh, <laughs> Still got it. I know, it's right here. <laughs> uh, anyway, go Spurs go, go Spurs go. And then I read that he was doing the estate sale. This is April 25th. So I wrote him, estate sale, question mark, 25 exclamation points. He says, I'm going out of business with a D. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? What? Can I help you? He goes, just buy something. <laughs> I said, of course. He goes, well, I've got blisters just texting on my fingers. And I'm just texting them. Anyway. Go, Spurs, go. And big F word. And I said, well, I said, I love you. I get a text from uh, the lady saying that he's at the uh, a hospice, and I didn't I didn't know he was sick again. I had no clue. Uh, he was doing better. And I told Nikki I'd come by after the gig. I said it's midnight, too late, twelve thirty, maybe even one. She can come anytime. And uh, I went down there, and Tam, who probably you were there, and Claude Morgan was there. We just I think we told stories and laughed, and, and his breathing was just getting horrible. You can hear the gurgling sounds. You've been around anything like that, you know, you don't forget that sound. And it was the first time I walked in uh, to that building, <laughs> lost my mother in law in the same building. And it was just a hard thing to do. But we prayed for him, and, and as we were leaving, I knew it was going to be that night. I knew in my heart, 
I had lost my dad the same way. And you know, when you when you when you're leaving, you know. And the hard thing to do, I tell people, is to pray to just be done with it. You don't want to say that. You don't want to lose your loved one. But my dad was a pastor, and I, you know, sometimes you got to pray what you don't want to pray. But I, I sat there and I, I whispered in his ear. I said, "I love you. You don't have to hang on for us. If you're hanging on for us." Your memory is embedded in my heart for the rest of my life. I've known you 30 years, and we've had so many wonderful times. Uh, but if you need to go and you're tired, then you need to go and you're tired. And I knew it. I didn't want to leave, but I knew if we didn't leave, he wasn't going to go. Nobody wants to leave with somebody hanging on. Nobody wants that feeling. And I knew in my heart, I told my wife when I got home, I said, I, I know it. But I got to say goodbye to a very dear, wonderful friend who was supportive of my career since the time I got here. I got to San Antonio, knew one person. I moved in with my girlfriend, and she goes, what are you gonna do here? You can't just mooch off of me. I said, I'll get a job. Yeah. We were at the McDonald's on San Pedro, right next to somewhere else. I walked next door, and I came back, I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, but through, through that job, I and mean, the day I, Stephen Ray Vaughn died, Ron was just yelling at me, cursing at me, because I'm on the counter yelling at people. I'm yelling at all the customers, you need to get the F out of here. And he didn't buy his record. He was alive yesterday, he didn't buy his record. And Ron's like, get out of the counter, you're gonna need to go home and fire me and everything. I got fired. <laughs> also, at the hospice, um, was Rudy. You heard Rudy sing the Lord's Prayer earlier, but there was a lot of music therapy happening as well. And uh, this is our final performance from Rudy, and it's fitting as it was a really important day that you were there with Ron. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah well. I'll let you, you can tell that. Thank you. The last time I saw Ron, the night before he died, uh, this was the last song of mine I played for him. And uh, one more for you, Pally. I didn't want it to be, and nor did Uncle Ronnie want it to be, a traditional memorial service. And uh, when I was kind of trying to figure out what to do, I thought, what better fitting way to do it than an open mic? So I hope that it has been meaningful to you guys to get a little sample from friends, from colleagues, from musicians, from family, to hear about this wonderful man that we know that's forever young, Ron Young. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm his uh, adopted daughter spiritually, but biological niece. And um, I just want to share my life with him. 
as a child, and my life became him as an adult. As a child, he was Uncle Ronnie. And, uh, you know, we kind of hung out, kind of not. I think he thought I was just this, this kid, didn't really know what to do with me. And, huh? Doesn't like children. Doesn't like children, right? He doesn't like children. Okay, I won't be around the bush time. He doesn't like children. And he didn't know what, he didn't know what to do with me, really. And then I would sing and perform. I think I was doing, uh, my grandmother would put me up on a table and I would have like a towel and a pretend microphone and I would do Crystal Gale impersonations. I thought I was the coolest because I would have the long hair and I would do Don't Make My Brown Eyes Blue and I would do all these wonderful things. And I think at that point he thought, oh, wait a minute, I see something there. That's a kid, I'll make you a star, right? And he saw something and so he, we bonded and you know, while we weren't around a lot because he was doing his cool stuff with the music scene, um, I was blossoming myself as a performer. And But there was one day, um, and my mom, even though my parents got divorced, my mom made sure that I had a relationship with my father and, and um, my fam and family. And I literally have every single birthday card every single Christmas card that Uncle Ronnie, letter, everything that he ever wrote me. He always said, your old Uncle Ronnie, your Uncle Ronnie, love your Uncle Ronnie. And, you know, he'd always say, keep shining, keep, you know, smiling, you know, and he'd always give me something powerful or something um, inspiring, something supportive about me as a musician, uh, as a performer, because he knew as a musician, it's a tough road, whatever side of the entertainment business I was going to be on. And I didn't know, and I don't know if you guys know, I learned this later in life, that when he was at SAC, um, many people think that he was an RTVF major, at the time it was just RTV, I think. Um, and, but actually, he started out as a theater major. He was part of their children's theater program. And so my background is in theater, my degree is in theater, so he was very um, appreciative that I went down the direction of theater as a kid. But, Anyway, so as a kid, so I was his flower girl, as I mentioned, um, when he was married. Um, and I, apparently a lot of y'all were there. And uh, so then he kind of started, I was like this, well, I was this child thing, um, but I had something about me that he kind of bonded with and he kind of liked. Um, we, we, we kept in touch for many, many years. And um, like I said, all while he was in Nashville. There was one time he was, uh, him and Sharon, before he left for Nashville, they were living on, in a house over on Club Drive, and my mom made a point for me to continue having a relationship, as I mentioned. So we went over there, and he wanted to show me movies and talk to me about the entertainment business and the road that, I mean, I think I was fifth grade, and it was a, <laughs> he was gonna tell me about the business. And so he plays for me this movie. He said, I'm gonna tell you all about acting and all about comedy. And I'm like, wow, like my uncle's so cool. And he plays this movie for me, called Water with Michael Caine. I'm in fifth grade. I didn't get it. 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 Do you remember, Mom? I was like, am I supposed to laugh at this? I didn't get it. As an adult, I've seen the movie, and now I get it. <laughs> he was trying to show me that every actor can be in a bad movie and still make it a good movie, but so what kind of actor do I want to be, you know? And so um, I understand that now. So if you've not seen the movie, go see it. Michael Caine sometimes misses the mark, but he's still Michael Caine, and it can be, you can find the fun in it no matter what. So anyway, but in this house, there was just albums, 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 eight tracks, cassettes, everywhere. Everything amazing about music history was in, in his house. It was literally an homage and a museum to music history and he was so much about music and musicology and and he would say oh this and he would tell me all that he'd go through albums and i think that's when he realized i wasn't just a kid that i was more than that and he really started to, to bond with me and i kind of became something important to him in his life when he went off to nashville so i was at uh, billy blues when he had his going away party and he introduced me to fred weiss and Fred Weiss ended up being my mentor and my college professor at SAC. And um, I wasn't in college yet, I was still a kid, but he introduced me and um, actually Mr. Weiss and I kept in touch, interestingly enough. 
Now, fast forward, I'm in college, and who's my professor? Mr. Weiss. Who's my mentor? Who's my academic advisor? Mr. Weiss. And he really took care of me all through college. That's probably why I never had to take an 8 o'clock class, though. Just saying. <laughs> Maybe it's a little nepotism. I don't know. Um, now I'm going to fast forward to my life with Uncle Ronnie as an adult. I don't want to talk about life with cancer because I want cancer to be the last thing that you remember. But it was something that bonded us for a long time. So when he moved back, um, I think Mama knows the exact day, November 18th, 2009. 19th, 2000, okay, see, I was close. Um, we reconnected in person, we had lunch right away, and he literally came to every single play that I was in, gave me some feedback, came to, <laughs> in a perfect way, it was good, it was constructive criticism. He came to all my film festivals. I was even in a crappy documentary, pays the bills, right, sometimes? I was in a crappy documentary um, by a filmmaker. I mean, it's a good friend, but it just wasn't turned out to be really good. But he even came to that, like short films, feature films, plays. One play that I was in, I guess I should have prepared him, um, I was a little bit scandalous on stage, and um, I think my other uncle, Marky, was in the audience, and so uh, <clears throat> the only thing Uncle Ronnie said to me afterwards was, yeah, let's not advertise this show. I don't think I want people to see it this one, because uh, I was pretty scantily dressed in that show. Um, but anyway, so, but he was proud of me no matter what, and every single show or movie, he'd always either Send me an e uh, first of his letters, and then it became emails, and I have all those. Just telling me how proud of us, how proud of me he is. This morning, I took a screenshot of a conversation. He even watched me when I was in a parade on TV, and he said, to my favorite parade float, princess, I love you, and you're the daughter I wish I'd always, I, I never had, I wish I had. And I thought that was pretty cool. So as an adult, in the last five years in particular, I mentioned how I had a company and he opened doors to me, but it was after he was diagnosed that we spent a lot of time together. And at first, I wasn't able to get a lot of information or make decisions. I was blessed that Tana was his caregiver, but he wanted me involved. And they wouldn't give me much information because a niece is not necessarily next to kin. So we put daughter on everything. And so it got really confusing when my dad was there, and then it got really confusing my mom was there, and they'd be like, oh, so that's how it is in their family. No, no, it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually my other dad, uncle, we just call him dad, uncle, something like that in our family. Don't ask questions. <laughs> um, but we really became bonded forever. And he would tell me so much about how proud of me he was. And that he would say, you're doing all the things I wish I did. As a performer, he goes, and y'all are gonna, it's gonna be interesting to hear this, but he'd say, I was always scared, but I did it and I tried. I may not have been very good, but I tried. He goes, you're really good. And he goes, keep doing it. And he goes, I'm so proud of you. And he goes, you've met so many people and you're so kind, you're so professional. And he goes, you make me so proud. And he goes, you have the guts to do things that I can never have done. And I said, what? Oh my God, you're like famous and everything. <laughs> like, you've had such a successful career. And he goes, he goes, yeah, but none of that pales in comparison. He goes, I'm just so proud. And so even though he was Ron Young and so proud, he could still look at me and think that I was something great. And there's a great picture of us when I'm at his thing. When I'm doing, he asked me to MC his CD release party, and he's looking at me. And that was that day. I remember he told me, he goes, I can't believe I'm on stage with you. And I said, I can't believe I'm on stage with you. And so it was a great opportunity for us. Now, there were some other interesting moments, too. I mentioned the Kip Takers thing earlier. Yeah. So we would get into it, and we would bicker. And he would be annoying sometimes, and I'd be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, he's like, you work too much, you work too much. Or then the forever conversation 
up until even a few weeks ago, when are you getting married? 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 I want to walk you down the aisle. When are you getting married? When are you getting married? When are you getting married? And I said, I don't know, Uncle Ryan. He's like, I, I want to see you get married. I want to see you get married. And so um, even that, I think we were in the hospice. And I was like, I guess I could leave Claude's here. And he wants to marry us, I guess. Marry somebody. <laughs> There's lots of ministers here. And his eyebrow went up. Remember that? Yeah. I was like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> not doing that. Not doing that. Um, but I know that if that day ever happens, well, I'll make sure that there's a place, a table setting for him, so he will be able to see me. And um, anyway, um, there was a day that he, and he always wanted to make sure I was taken care of. We'd go out to eat, and he'd want to pay. I was like, Uncle Ronnie, no, save your money for all your medical bills. He's like, but I want to, I want to take, I want you to know that you're loved and taken care of. I said, just you being with me, and. All of our hugs and all of our advice and all of our time together, that's how I know that I'm loved. And you always try. You always want to take care of me. And I'm sure that you heard all about it all the time, Tom. I want to take care of No, I'm, I'm okay. I want you to take care of you. And so there was one day that he bought tickets to see, um, he knows so much, I love magic. And so he bought tickets as a gift for me to see a magic show at the Majestic, the Illusionist. And so this was most recently, it was in January. We go see the show. And he was, I mean, I, he was such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was such a jerk. He was everything. That lady smells. Did you see how rude that person is? Or, I can't hear. It's too loud. That smells. Or, that, I mean, it was just so bad that day. And I went, and then we go um, there stairs and I had just come off of work, and I'm like, oh my God, really, this is what's going to happen today? And so I was like, okay, it's okay, it's, it's, it's Uncle Bunny, it'll pass, he's just frustrated right now. And so I want to take the elevator. And so I said, let's go take the elevator. And he goes, I want everyone to stop telling me what I can and can't do. I can do this. And, da, da, da. and I said, Uncle Ronnie, I said, I know we're both superstars here, we both have be in the spotlight, but right now it's not about you because I'm wearing high heels and I'm done. And I want to take the elevator, so it's not always about you. Oh. And then he turned into Uncle after that, and he wasn't Ron. And then he was carrying Uncle Ron. He's like, oh my gosh, are you okay? Why don't you take it? Can I help carry you? I just wanted to be here with you. I'm so sorry. And I said, sometimes you're just, what's the word? And he goes, Crusty. I said, Crusty. You're crusty. Sometimes you're crusty. And he goes, Do you think I should write a song about that? <laughs> and then he started making some parodies and stuff. And he took all these famous songs and turned them into parodies about being a crotchety, crusty old man. And it was a lot of fun. And then the whole evening was literally magical. And I will forever remember that. And then I'm so glad, as I mentioned, Jerry capturing those days. And then he would come over to our house, um, my mom and my stepdad. And then it got really interesting because then he would say that my stepdad was his brother-in-law and that my other uncle on my mom's side was his other brother-in-law. It's like, I think people are going to get real confused with how our family dynamic is. It's really good. <laughs> but family is what you make of it. And he had family. We are all family of Ron Young's, friends and family. And I just am so grateful that now you guys are my extended family, and uh, we are together all forever young. And to pay homage in the best way to send him off a little bit. Um, today is the memorial service. Tomorrow there is a celebration of life reception. You are all invited. It's going to be at Grady's on Wetmore at 2 o'clock. There's going to be uh, a jam session. Uh, Ruben V will be playing. Um, Eric Freeland from um, Los Number Three Dinners, Augie Myers, um, Jimmy Spachek. These, these are amazing guys that he supported, that supported him, and I'm so grateful that um, it's going to be pretty awesome, I gotta say. So there's going to be barbecue and in perfect Uncle Ronnie fashion, lots of banter, so please keep up the jokes and have a lot of camaraderie. So come tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Grady's on Wetmore. It's our family gift to you. Please join us. Um, but the best way to send him off today at this part of his transition into um, his next chapter of life 
I gave everyone forks. If you didn't get one, I'm sure you got one at the um, Tana and then you passed them out. I think we need to hold up our forks because... Your fork's uh, bigger. My fork's bigger, yes, because I'm going to put mine in the, in the well, fork guitar. It uh, so, what, what was the name of this song again? Stick a fork in us. Let's all say that together. Stick a fork in us. Honey, I'm very good. That's right. So, I appreciate you guys being here, but we're not totally done because I think Ruben said it best. He's in our heart. He's in our memories forever. Um, and I greatly appreciate all the outpouring of love, of support, and as uh, we go on, um, you know, please think of more ideas and stories of Ron that you want to share, and um, my last thing I'm going to end you with, when I said ideas, what I mean by that is um, I decided to start a foundation. Um, I don't have a lot of money, but what I do have, I want to give. There are so many um, people that came to his Benefits, we had two benefits in particular um, to help for his medical care. The unfortunate thing when you're a musician or a performing artist, I'm an actor, a producer, so as a performing artist, you don't have um, insurance readily available or you don't make a lot of money, etc. We all know these things as, as struggling artists. Um, and so um, we had a benefit. And the first one, we raised a lot of money. The second one raised even more. And there are so many other musicians and performing artists that need help to bridge the gap of some of the medical funding. Can't pay all the bills, but I'm starting a foundation. It's called the Forever Young Foundation to keep Ron's spirit, his message, his support, and what we do. We may not, I think Jerry said it best once to me, we as musicians are performing artists. We as musicians, I'm not a musician, but the musician, I'm a performing artist. We may not have a lot of money, but what we give, we give with our heart, we give with our skill, we give with our talent. And so I'm asking people, um, you can, if you'd like to make a donation, an organization that helped Uncle Ronnie these last couple years, it's called Music Cares. They're out of Nashville. They were very kind to help. Um, or you can hold your donations. And I'm going to be, um, I'm very fortunate that I work with one of the best philanthropists in all of South Texas, Gordon Hartman. And he has, um, said that after we open our water park that he's going to meet with me and tell me how to start a foundation, even if I just have a little bit and what I can do. And so if you'd like to hold your donations and make something later, um, I've got some ideas. A lot of you may have some ideas of how we can raise some funds and make an opportunity to make an annual um, event in Ron's memory, kind of like we do at SAC. We have the Fred Weiss. We have um, the Fred Fest. Um, I forgot what it's called now. Fred Stock. Fred Stock. Yeah, Fred Stock. Um, for Fred Weiss, we're going to have a Ron Young event um, to help with keeping the um, funds going to help musicians and performing artists that need medical care because we have to stop this disease. We have to find a way to find a cure. In the meantime, we're going to help each other. So thank you all so much for being here. If you'd like to join one last song, if I could get some of you guys that know Burn Down the Honky Tonk, come on up and sing it. Thank you so much. Hey, and while uh, while we're on the subject of giving, uh, if we can, uh, I think we should show our, our love and appreciation for uh, for Nikki and Tana and David and for Bobby making this all happen. Ron did the groundwork to, um, to, to plan out the business end of this and he uh, he created the song list of, of what he thought would be a, sound, a, a great soundtrack for his, his send-off. Uh, that's what was playing before everything started today. Uh, but the, the bulk of the work that you've seen done for all of this, and it's been a lot at a really difficult time, was done by these folks <coughs> for Ron, but also for all of us. So I, I, I think they deserve a really big round of applause. Um, I also want to thank Jerry for doing the, the cards out there. I want to thank Taylor for filming it, and I want to thank Wendy for the slideshow. And, oh, and Betty and Rick for all your hospitality, for doing everything out there and all the wonderful things. The, the sign-in book, the photos, and 
end. So, so many people, like he said, it can't be done alone. And so let's do it. Let's burn down the honky tonk, shall we, Rick? Lead us out.